high cholesterol, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, joint problems. Sounds like a list of your grandfather's health issues, right? Well, it used to be. Now, however, that same list of symptoms could be applied to a 12-year-old boy due to, the due to the health effects of childhood obesity. According to the Children's Defense Fund's report on childhood obesity, one in three children are considered overweight. And this will be the first generation in American history who, despite medical advancements, will live shorter lives than their parents. Childhood obesity, defined by the CDC as excess body fat, has reached dangerous levels of prevalence, and we have a responsibility to respond if we want to maintain the health of our generation. Through the examination of today's epidemic of childhood obesity, I hope to not only enlighten you on the depth of the problem of childhood obesity, but also improve your awareness of common causes of this epidemic. And finally, reveal what steps can be taken to help resolve this issue at all levels, from national policy to personal habits. Once an anomaly in rarity, childhood obesity has drastically increased in prevalence in the last 50 years. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, it has tripled in prevalence since 1960, reaching levels of 15% in all children in 2000, and increasing to 18% in 2010. Why is this so alarming? Why is this an issue? Just to begin, 70% of obese youth already exhibit <clears throat> at least one risk factor of, for heart disease. Other health de deficits now linked to children through obesity include <clears throat> chronic headaches, double vision, sleep apnea, and shortness of breath, and even chronic orthopedic complications. Obesity has also been linked as a risk factor to several types of cancer. Not only does obes obesity inflict serious health effects on those inflicted by it, but also poses a serious financial burden to the rest of the country. It is estimated by the United States Department of Health and Human Services that between the years of 1997 to 1999, hospital costs for obesity-related treatments and surgeries reached dollar amounts of $127 million. That's up over $90 million from the $35 million spent on the same issues from 1971 to 1981. <clears throat> Therefore, the consequences of this disease are not just individual, but extend to the entire population of the United States. I think we've identified that childhood obesity is an issue that certainly needs addressing. But in order to be able to confront such a pervasive and detrimental issue, we must first examine the causes of the disease so that we can know where to attack it. Causes of obesity have two main roots. One is a genetic predisposition. This is an unavoidable leaning toward obesity caused by several biological factors that simply may be inherent in one's genetic code. These factors cannot be treated in that they would require specific alterations of one genetic, one's genetic code, a technology that we have not developed. However, arguably more important in today's obesity epidemic are behavioral and environmental conditions that lead to obesity. Behavioral and environmental causes include bad eating habits causing nutritional deficits, low activity levels, and environments not conducive to healthy lifestyles. These factors certainly are malleable, requiring only lifestyle changes, and can be linked to a major reason why childhood obesity is so prevalent today. The first of these factors is nutrition. According to the Children's Defense Fund's report on childhood obesity, only 20% of high school children eat the recommended five servings of fruit and vegetables a day. Furthermore, they report that fast food consumption has increased 500% since 1970. A report from the Department of Health and Human Services also identifies that children are exhibiting an increased frequency of eating more away from home, increasing 12% in the last 20 years. Kids are also drinking more sugary drinks, now averaging 22 ounces in soda consumption per day. Finally, kids are snacking more. Portion sizes of these salty snacks have increased. A study of nutrition consumption revealed that of the identified vegetable consumption among children, 46% of those were fried potatoes, and only 8% were dark green vegetables. Coupling this data with the fact that nutrition, nutri nutrient-dense diets and low-fat diets are linked to a lower frequency of obesity, it is no wonder that we are in the same situation that we are today. And that's just nutrition. What about activity levels? In order for children to maintain a healthy lifestyle, it is recommended that they get at least an hour of moderate to vigorous activity, preferably daily. However, two-thirds of children do not achieve this standard. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, 61% of children don't, present, don't participate in any organized physical activity 
In public grade school, physical activity frequency averages only 50 minutes per week. TV watching, however, averages four hours per day for kids, and high levels of TV watching correlate with high levels of, of obesity. With such sparse levels of activity in kids, how can we expect anything different from the levels of obesity that we see today? And we have not even examined how our environment can affect these levels. Urban communities where crime is more prevalent and where large art outdoor areas are not available have been connected with increased levels of obesity in children. These kids are not only unable to play outside due to safety concerns, but would have nowhere to play even if it were safe enough. The Department of Health and Human Services reports that an increased spacing in suburban communities may also increase levels of obesity because it discourages walking and bike riding. While this data may seem disheartening to see how far we've fallen in encouraging the health of children, be encouraged, because these are all factors that we can change. Let us approach this issue from levels as high as national policy all the way down to daily decision making in the home in order to determine how we can best tackle the ep epidemic of childhood obesity. Due to the troubling reports in the last 15 years, obesity has received national attention. In the June of 2005, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences sponsored a conference to examine solutions to the American obesity problem. Child Now, a national child advocacy organization based out of California, is currently lobbying the Federal Communications Commission to discourage television advertising that appeals to children for food products, encouraging snacking and unhealthy eating. Michelle o Obama even heads a national obesity awareness program called Let's Move. The program calls for awareness of the national obesity problem, encourages increased physical education, and calls for making healthier food cheaper to stimulate healthier eating habits. To quote Mrs. Obama on finding a solution, this does not require any fancy tools or technologies. The only question is whether we have the will. While obesity has become a national concern and national policy change is important to mobilize local areas for change, true resolution lies in our communities and in our homes. So where in the community can we make the biggest dent in the problem of obesity? Well. Just look to where children spend the bulk of their waking hours, at school. Nowadays, schools provide all sorts of exemptions for engaging in daily physical activity. However, according to a recent study, only a one hour increase in physical activity per week in school aged children resulted in a 31% decrease in body mass index. So how can we combat this issue when schools are providing outlets that decrease children's accessibility to achieving better health? Furthermore, changes in community organization that encourage more physical activity could be extremely valuable. In London, footpath use was found to increase when the lighting of footpaths were increased due to the residents feeling like the environment was safer to walk. Also, the city of Toronto experienced a 23% increase in bike use with the addition of bike lanes to their streets. 25 cities in America have agreed to seek out increases in citywide physical activity through adjusting community design. However, none of these changes can have lasting effects without changes in the home. As the ultimate role models for their children, parents have the highest level of responsibility for the health of their children. Parents are the primary teachers of eating habits for children and the encouragers of activity. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, the biggest challenge today to achieving a healthier society is making exercise attractive, exciting, and enjoyable. How can children see exercise as appealing if they receive no reinforcement from their parents? Furthermore, a study in Nevada revealed that increased prevalence of untraditional work schedules and decreased parent involvement has led to unhealthy eating habits in children and inability to engage in activity because of a lack of supervision. So the true weight rests on parents. Is the health of your children a priority? And if you're not a parent, how are you encouraging health in your community? We like to attribute our health issues to grand national policy problems, but the true solution lies with you. Do you have the discipline to maintain your own health and encourage the health of those around you? Thanks. Are there any questions? What made you choose this topic? Um, we talked about it a lot in a one of my classes this past semester, uh, and I thought it was kind of crazy how fast it's um, obesity has actually become a problem, and like recently within the past like 30 years. Um, so 
And I think it's a big deal. And I understand why people don't like activity. So I'd want to encourage people to do that. So. Cool. Um, do you think, like, um, the location uh, where people live, do you think it affects, you know, obesity? Like, people who stay in the rural areas? Like, do you think that they are more predisposed to obesity than those that stay in the urban communities? Uh, I mean, there's a lot, I think there's a lot of different factors that go into it, probably. But as far as, like I was saying earlier about the environment, of course, a rural area will be more, um, you know, you'll have more space to actually, like, go around and, like, you know, run around and stuff like that, whereas in an urban area, you don't. But uh, there's also parts of, like, rural society um, that could make people more predisposed just because of eating habits and that kind of thing. Um, so I think it, it depends on multiple factors, but uh, but I think that there is a potential for rural areas being less, um, having less of a predisposition 